Good evening, and welcome to the uh, Finance Subcommittee meeting of the Brockton uh, School Committee, Tuesday, March 16th. Due to the ongoing, whoop, due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and state of emergency, on March 12, 2020, Governor Baker issued an executive order temporarily suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, GL Chapter 30A, Section 20. Pursuant to the order, public bodies are temporarily relieved from the open meeting law's requirement that meetings be held in public places, open and physically accessible to the public, so long as measures are taken to ensure public access to the body's deliberations through adequate alternative means. This meeting will be held and will be accessible to the public via Brockton Community Access, Brockton Public Schools website, www.bpsma.org, YouTube, and Comcast Channel 98. The public can access this meeting via the following link, www.youtube.com forward slash the Brockton Channels. I hear that in my sleep sometimes at this point. Um, okay. Next item is to call the roll to establish a quorum. <clears throat> okay. Mayor Sullivan, I don't believe, is with us yet. Uh, D'Agostino here. Miss Asak. Here. Um, Mrs. Mendez had reached out and let me know that uh, she had a family situation, so she won't be able to join us tonight. Mr. Minicello. Mr. Rodriguez. Here. Mrs. Sullivan. Here. Mr. Sullivan. Here. Here. Okay. He's on Zoom. Can we right work you. on that? Oh, he's right on there. Okay. Right behind you. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. All right. We All have right, a quorum established. Sullivan. All right. And the mayor has just joined us as well, so let me mark that. Well, very good. Okay, so uh, two items on the agenda for finance this evening, the FY 2022 school department budget, and then other business. Um, so, uh, Mr. Petronio, I assume you'll be leading the discussion on the budget? Yes, yeah, so I'm gonna continue from where we left off at our last meeting, but before right. we do go back to the book, I just handed out the article that just came out in the paper today highlighted a couple of lines on it that um, the new um, package, the COVID stimulus package that came out, says the city of champions is expected to receive $35.6 million. Now on the second page I highlighted that money goes directly to the city. Um, the mayor will have access to that. It says we expect to see the money in 60 days. So um, that's great news. Good news for us, good news for the city. and the. You know, the mayor will decide and direct how those funds are to be used. I don't have the details on them. I'm meeting with Troy Clarkson, the CFO of the city tomorrow. We're hoping that these funds can be carried for many years um, forward, help us with all of our budgets. Um, we'll know more as we go, but we'll bring that, I'll bring that up in uh, future meetings as we get more um, directors and, and information on it. But I think that's a huge win. It's a um, great, you know, work on the mayor, working with our senators um, to get these funds in. Wonderful news, Mayor. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee and superintendent and, and all though. Um, yeah, it was a wonderful day yesterday. Congressman Lynch uh, and the federal delegation really stepped up. Uh, we have to thank, of course, uh, President Biden. Um, so the money that's coming here, as the Congressman said, it's about healing and rebuilding uh, the ravages of COVID. So we'll, uh, we'll work uh, together to figure out the best way to spend the money. I did make it clear to the unions today that this money is not to be used for contract negotiations. That's not what the purpose is. The purpose is to recover um, and, and we'll continue the effort. So I want to thank Aldo. I want to thank Troy Clarkson. and of course, Mike. Um, last year when we were playing for the budget, we, we meet weekly. Um, we started doing that again uh, and it, it's going to be a set meeting. Um, but this is, a, this is a game changer. It's awesome. Um, this money has nothing to do with the Federal CARES Act money, which is the $18 million. Um, and, you know, I do expect um, that we will see this money within uh, 60 days. Thank you. Great. great. That's great news. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Petronio. So jumping back into the budget book that I handed out last meeting, um, second page in from the end, 
What I did was I did some estimations to come up with what our FY22 budget would look like for the school department. Um, didn't really factor in any contract settlements, didn't factor in any, any future costs. I basically looked at what we currently have now um, and where I think carrying those forward into the new year will be without those additional costs. Um, again, rough estimate, about $8.6 million of available funds that um, you know, the committee will look at and decide on the best way to spend those funds. Um, you know, the Student Opportunity Act has given us certain directions. Our um, plan from the Department of Ed has given us certain directions to follow as far as getting Brockton on a certain course. So this is honestly the, um, the first budget that we've ever had um, additional monies to really look at. I mean, we started out last year with something COVID hit, but right. for the past 10 years, we've never been in this position. So this puts the committee in a great position. I think some of the challenges we'll be looking at in our, our continued meetings will be how we're gonna do our staffing, you know, what we feel is appropriate for every building. As you know, as you know we've got additional healthcare issues now, you know, that we bring up. Right now, we're using a temp agency to help cover our COVID, um, COVID nursing areas um, but we did a temp agency because we don't know, you know how long we need them for or, or whether we continue to need them, but we have issues like that. We've got social distancing issues we're looking at. Um, we're using some of the um, CARES funding that we received to put modular classrooms on some of the schools so that we can space out the students a little better where we need them. We've been using those funds for plexiglass shields and whatnot. Um, substitute teachers, we don't know uh, going forward. We've always cut that budget every year and we need to really put that budget back in and we don't know again how long the virus will continue or whether we'll have you know um, a lot more absenteeism in the fall um, due to the virus so that's another budget area um, technology we put a lot of money into um, but we have to look now we have to look at maintaining that so we can't just put it in once and and not look at it again for years we have to look at maintaining that um, just our overall plan for our students, how we move forward. And that was the net school spending budget. On the non-net, um, as you know, we've uh, ordered the, the buses to cover um, basically half of our fleet, um, working through the funding there. I've given the figures to Troy to do his rough budget of where I think we need. Um, we were around 15 million for FY21 is what we had for funds. Um, we had some carryover funds. I'm estimating we need about 13 and a half, maybe close to 14 million for um, this year. We saved some money in buying our own buses, so I'm reflecting that in our totals here. Our student population is down a little bit, so that's reflected in here also. Um, if the students all show back up September 1st, that's wonderful for us. We have to make accommodations for that. But um, overall, I think we're in good shape to move forward um, with non-net. The city uh, fully funded us this year, which was great and um, they've been you know, supporting us on that um, going forward, so I think we're in great shape. The last page, I put in the budget timeline, because I know every year this comes up. Uh, it basically goes through how we begin our budget. We begin asking departments their needs and their requirements in November, and we slowly build our budget from that point. I factored in you know, what happens in November, December, when my office starts um, you know, taking all those figures and, and adding them into our budget planner. Then we wait for January for the governor to come out with his budget, which he did. It looks, you know, great for us. Um, overall, the net up a little over 18 million, which is huge. Um, and then we wait for the house. So the house is um, usually the middle of April. So if the house number is pretty close with the governor's number, we can feel confident going forward that we can build our budget off that number. Um, last year, again, between the governor and the house, COVID hit, so that number was cut tremendously. So I, at this point, my um, discussions with people on, on, on Beacon Hill is that everything looks good, everything looks solid. Um, you know, uh, we've, even if the virus is here, we still have it under control. It uh, looks like the economy is, is coming in faster than we planned. I know the city revenues look good, the state revenues look pretty good. So I think uh, in a few weeks, we'll know a number from the, from the House, and I think from them to the Senate, there won't be much of a change. Um, but either way, we're in a very positive position. So. I think this might be the first year we actually get our budget done, you know, as soon as the Senate uh, the Compromise Committee pass their budget. I think the mayor will be ready in early, early June or so um, to get his budget settled, uh, and we should roll into July 1st um, this year, knowing where we stand. Well, this will be the first time in my six years that we're not laying people off. 
and not still piecing the budget together well into August. Uh, so hopefully, I mean, I know, you know, last year we were taking the same victory lap and then the pandemic hit. So I guess I'll say cautiously optimistic that what appears to be the case will continue. Um, so and keep, uh, keep in mind that with our discussions I've had with the Department of Ed and with, with um, you know, the, the people from the House and Senate, the Student Opportunity Act money is, was not really directed at settling contracts raises. Right. It was looking at filling the gaps that we had from special ed, from health insurance, from ELL, you know, for English language learners, in our budget, and low-income uh, students. That's where the money is really directed towards. So although it sounds like a windfall, it's to correct the positions that we've been in for the past 10 years that the, the state had been lacking on, um, you know, when it's the suburbs versus the urbans, this now gives us a chance to get back up uh, to speed and, and get on equal playing grounds with the suburbs. And hopefully we'll continue to see this each year. No, and those are important points too, and, and, and are, are worth reiterating that, yeah, right, exactly, the Student Opportunity Act, you know, when, when we went around and, and several of us went to talk to other towns, what, again, it was the same story, underfunding of special education, underfunding economically disadvantaged students, underfunding health insurance costs. So, you know, um, fortunately this now acknowledges and, and gets us in the direction of having those, those costs adequately funded so that you know we're not dipping into other areas or pulling from other areas to subsidize those costs, which obviously is what's put us in such a bind for several years, probably ten years now. You exactly. know, um, so and I'm I, I I think this is an important point that you brought up, and I want to make sure that we don't miss this because in in past years, obviously, we cut technology substantially, and we had to, right? We were trying to save as many. Um, jobs as we could and as many programs as we could so um, but now we've bought all these devices we're a one-to-one -one district um, you know we've got to make sure that we put money in the budget to have adequate staff to keep those devices running um, which is something you know you've all heard me talk about before and I know I'm not the only one that feels that way we got to make sure that we don't we don't want to do is say we're a one-to-one -to, -one to district, but 7,000 of them are broken and waiting repair, you know? Um, and our staff, our IT people have kind of communicated that they could use a little help um, keeping up with things. So I hope we'll be able to give them a little bit of relief. Sure, and again, if I could say again, this money that came from the Student Opportunity Act, that's because the school committee, the city council, the mayor's office really pushed on Beacon Hill the fact that we were underfunded fact that the state was not meeting their obligation. So it was all that um, work, that pressure that was put on them that finally forced us to come down. We had a lawsuit prepared to go. It's uh, honestly still wrapped up tight in a, in a can, ready to go, but they realized that it was coming and you know they've done what was necessary now to um, fix the unequal funding uh, problem right. that was happening in the state. So Absolutely, said. yeah, and it was, it was a long time coming, but a lot of advocacy by all of us in the room and our former superintendent and former mayor and the current mayor and current superintendent you know so that it was a lot of long time advocacy that got us here but uh, and and I would say relationships that we all have with our with our delegation too I mean I think that really made a big difference in being able to get this done without going to court which is obviously the ideal situation if you can accomplish things without that if if we have to do it we have to do it but um, so good um, any other questions, comments from members of the committee? Mrs. Sullivan? Um, I just wanted to say, Aldo, you did a lot of work for that too, for that Student Opportunity Act, him and Superintendent Kathy Smith, so you should be thanked. They, they went to a lot of meetings over many years for that. So, and the executive team, and um, Mike was the assistant then. All those people really pushed, um, and former Mayor Carpenter really pushed for there was a lot of meetings, and if they didn't do that, I don't think we would have really gotten this, you know? But um, it was a great job. I just wanted to ask a question to Aldo on the sure. SOA money, so that can't be used for any contracts, you said. Not that, not that it can't. We can't give it all away, basically. Okay. I mean, it's for our budget, yep. but we have to show the state that we've taken these additional funds and the changes we've made in our programs, whether it's more 
um, you know, uh, more guidance counselors, more adjustment counselors, um, more you know, um, after school programs, more homework programs. We have to show with these funds what we've done for these for these children and how we're helping them. So as um, long as the, the plan is good and solid, again, the, the, this funding is supposed to continue for the next five years. It's a seven year plan. This is year two. So they're supposed to keep bringing this in. So, you know, the superintendent. But they didn't fund it year one. So it's six years left. Well, right. <laughs> it's right. next, well, it's they next year and six years left. They didn't fund it. Extension, but. So yeah. it's next, this year, FY, you know. In my book, it's year <laughs> two because they said they'd fund it all by 2027. Yeah, I, I don't so. see it that way, but we'll see. <laughs> but we also want to thank, again, um, our state reps. Yeah, uh, who put a lot of work in on the Hill. Um, Claire Cronin, Jerry Cassidy, Mike Brady, Michelle Dubois spent a lot of time um, talking to their colleagues up on the Hill for several years. Uh, they, pushing they got this us as in well. to see the speaker. They yep. got us in to see the Senate president. And, you know, they worked hard with, with all of us oh, and, to help make this happen. Okay. Mrs. Sullivan. I got one more question when Mike's done. No, go ahead. Go okay. Ahead. And will the um, stimulus... COVID stimulus package money, will that be directed at a certain thing? Will we have stipulations it's, like- it, It's coming through as grants. So we've got a million two that is supposed to be for all the necessary items we need to like reopen school and, and clean them and keep them healthy and safe. Then we're receiving about 15 million in additional, it's coming through Title I. And those funds don't have as much restrictions on them. Those funds can be used, um, again, for, for long-term planning additions to the budget. Um, but as I've always said, to me, these are one-time funds. So we need to really look at not adding costs that are going to be continual, but adding benefits or improvements to the system. So I know that you know we might have to. We're looking at new, newer or better modulars at some of the schools. We might look at those funds for that. But everything comes in. We got a I don't know, $10,000 grant for, for mental health. That's coming in just for that. So they're coming through, and they all have a, you know, certain stipulations on them and how they're to be used. So. Okay. Thank you. And um. I, and May, I think this is a question for you. I think um, the money here in this article, I think there's separate money coming for schools through Title I again. Yeah, I mean. Uh, I don't think this part. Yeah, no, the congressman has indicated that there'll be other allotments of funds. Um, there's no hard dollar amount. Yep. Um, but now with the change administration up there. Um, Fair. Mike. President Biden definitely has Brockton on the radar. Um, you know, this money is, is a windfall, but also if you look at the increased vaccines that we're getting from Neighborhood Health Center being designated a federal designee. So again, um, I want to thank Lita Cronin. Claire Cronin uh, has a good relationship with President Biden and, you know, we're, we're starting to see some real benefits. That's great. Mr. Minicello. Um, I would like to basically mirror what my fellow school committee members said with regard to the hard work that was put into obtaining um, this result with uh, additional funds for the, you know, the inequity uh, in education. And I would just like to point out, and I'm sure m most of us know this, but for public consumption, that <clears throat> the state always went uh, along and said that the lack of funds really had nothing to do with the results and the scores and um, you know, the um, testing test results um, that Brockton and other communities had for these pools of children, uh, you know, special ed children, children below the poverty level, ELL children. Um, so they really didn't want to hear any excuse. They really had just basically a deaf ear. But I can warn everyone, and everyone knows this in this room, that they will have a hawk's eye to how this money is being spent. They had a deaf ear, but they will have a hawk's eye at how we spend this money and if, that it's spent wisely. Uh, and we all know that. You know, the people in this room know that. So mm -hmm. it must be wisely spent. It must be focused on improving testing uh, for results for our students, results in those areas, because they will be so sharp to criticize. Look at all this money and look at what you did if we do not show you know, the proof in the pudding from the funding and show the correlation, because we all know what the correlation was. The lack of funding and the cutting and the cutting and the cutting and the cutting for years to just patch together this boat and make it float in this community you know, took its toll. So you know, now is the time that we spend that money wisely because you know, people in the state will be watching, believe me. So. 
Yeah, so that's why they made us do the, the Student Opportunity Act plan, and that's all about it. Uh, closing the achievement gap, improvement performance, and like Mr. Minichello says, it's this is tied to accountability. So, um, and we're up to the task. Our teachers are up, our staff are up to the task, and um, on top of working hard to improve in achievement, we'll also, our uh, teachers and staff are up to um, helping our families and our students recover from COVID at the same time, the effects of COVID. So, um, like Mr. Minocello says, we have to spend it wisely, um, and you know, but we have to be up for the task because it will come with the accountability. Right. No, it's a good point, and you're spot on, Mr. Minocello. Um, they will be watching exactly what we do with this, and and if we can't show that that the majority of this money went into things that directly helped student outcomes, then you know. Uh, I mean, which is what we're going to do, obviously. Um, but I'm sure the state will be certainly looking, looking for that. And um, you know, so uh, anybody else comments, questions, Mr. Sullivan? I want to make sure you get a chance. I can't see you, so no. Okay. No, I'm also like. Okay, one second. I just wanted to ask um, the oh, superintendent. Okay. Now, would the state be looking at something like test scores, too? Yeah, um, not last year and not this year. Um, they're going to be, um, last year, obviously, there were none. This year, if there are, if they continue um, with the MCAS, um, they would be for, not for accountability uh, or rating school systems or schools. It will be strictly for diagnostic reasons um, to help us identify, you know, where students, how much uh, students have lost. Um, and we were also doing that with star testing, but um, it, none of the testing, so there's no, no account, accountability for last year. There's no, as far as testing accountability for this year either. So okay, thank you. we'll see what they do thank you. next year. Um, so, you know, it's a good thing that it's only for diagnostic and we'll see if they still go forward with the MCAS. I know there's a shorter version, um, K to, you know, f um, for grades three to eight, but um, it's not going to be used for accountability. Good. The only thing I asked uh, before the meeting wraps up is that, um, so principals are working now with the executive team um, and also Kelly Jones from bilingual department and uh, Laurie Mason from the special education department on um, looking at positions that may, may be needed. It has to be tied to student achievement. It has to be tied to schools that have sustainability plans and others, you know, schools that do not. It has to be tied to their data. Um, to see where their students are struggling and those how that's how we're going to select where to put positions um, We're also working closely with Sharon Wolder and John Snellgrove around what we need for Adjustment counselors and therapeutic support. So I just asked, asked the committee tonight if um, If we're allowed if to allow us in HR to advertise um, Like we did last year um, for pretty much every position um, Pen and we'll also say pend and fund and just so we can get a jump on um, looking for people, uh, you know, just applications. Uh, obviously, no interviews would start until a final budget is approved, but it helps us get ahead of the game. It helps us start to recruit, uh, go to, you know, some virtual, you know, college fairs that also help us recruit uh, at the, um, at traditionally uh, the black colleges to allow us to um, really start to recruit teachers of color. Um, so it gets us ahead of the game if we're allowed to advertise now. But again, we would put in uh, in the posting that this pen, it pens fund, pending funding. So basically, you're, and I assume you, you need a vote yeah. of the committee to, and all you're looking to do is just advertise for position, for basically to put out that, that we're looking for people. There's no certain number at this point. Exactly. Um, you know, you just want to start to market to yeah start right marketing that that we're hiring um which been a long change. time yeah yeah um so can you give us an idea because obviously you know you're just basically accepting applications is what you're looking for absolutely here. accepting applications no interviews would be set up there's no number approved by right. the school committee yet it's just basically being able to start to market ourselves and and recruit and 
go to college fairs and let people right. know that we're hiring, but there will be no number. Um, there will be no interviews until, again, we have to vet all these positions with the executive team, with the principals. They have to be positions that make sense, that are tied to the Student Opportunity Act and accountability, and, again, looking at um, the data from schools, so where these positions are needed. Uh, but, again, we would not hire uh, or even have interviews until the school committee passes a budget. And just out of curiosity, and I think it'd be good for the committee to know um, in the context of, of the vote that you're looking for, um, and, and I apologize if I'm putting you on the spot, I don't mean to, but do you have, either of you have a rough idea of when you'll be able to come to us with the numbers and types of positions, you know, more specifics? Yeah, we'll probably have uh, some of the information for you at the retreat. Okay. on the 27th, and then we would then have um, more information as we move into our finance subcommittee meetings in April. Okay, so early early April, the next, so that's basically two, three weeks. We Absolutely. Have yep. More detailed numbers. Just that's a very proactive, proactive move by the superintendent because I know right now there are at least two bills before the House and Senate for early retirement incentives. Mm -hmm. If those bills come through, you could see a lot of retirements happening, so we need to be prepared for if that is the case. Right. Actually, that's, there's two bills that have a three-year early retirement, and one bill I heard of has a five-year early retirement. So right. um, we need to be prepared, not only us, but also on the city side, police, fire, and so on. Right. So we basically need somebody to make a motion to allow the superintendent to start advertising and accepting applications for positions. Begin the, or we could, yeah, we could word it as to begin the recruiting process. Um, does anybody have any question or want to make the motion? Or I, I can make the motion. Uh, I make a motion that we authorize the superintendent to start uh, his due diligence in uh, the recruiting process uh, in lieu of uh, employment opportunities in the Brockton Public Schools and or because of vacancies or retirements. Okay, we have a motion on the floor by Mr. Minicello. Do we have a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Asak. I'll call the roll. Mayor Sullivan? Yes. D'Agostino? Yes. Ms. Asak? Yes. Mrs. Mendez isn't here. Mr. Minicello? Yes. Mr. Rodriguez? Yes. Mrs. Sullivan? Yes. Mr. Sullivan? Yes. Okay, motion carries unanimous. Aldo or, or, or Superintendent Thomas, anything else under item number one? Nope, that's it. Any other member of the committee have anything under item number one? All right, is there any other business to come before finance this evening? Yes, please, Mayor. Mike. Microphone. Uh, 10 30 a.m. The governor and Lieutenant Governor Polito will be here to take a tour of the, uh, the Shaw Center. They'll be here. <laughs> <laughs> I got to get better. I'm sorry about that, Mike. Uh, just a moment of personal privilege. I just wanted to uh, follow up on an email my office sent to uh, City Council, School Committee, and State Delegation today, the reps and Senator Governor Baker and Lieutenant Governor Polito will be coming to Brockton uh, tomorrow. Uh, we found out about it today. We welcome them. We thank them for coming to the City of Champions. 10 30 a.m. Tomorrow they want to take a tour of the Shaw Center to see how the collaboration between the City Clinic and Neighborhood Health Center, how successful it has been by evidence by how many teachers were vaccinated. It's been a raving success. So, again, if the elected officials uh, have the time or the availability, we'd love to see you tomorrow at 1030. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Anything else under there? Under, um, yeah. Easy for me to say. Under other business. No, then I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion to adjourn by Ms. Asak. Properly seconded by uh, Mrs. Sullivan. I'll call the roll. Mayor Sullivan. Yes. D'Agostino is a yes. Ms. Asak. Yes. Mr. Minicello. Yes. Mr. Rodriguez. Yes. Mrs. Sullivan. Yes. Mr. Sullivan. Yes. All right. The subcommittee is adjourned, and we got like two minutes, and we'll go right into policy. Thank you. <laughs>